Good afternoon. It's my joy and privilege to welcome you to Westmont and to introduce our afternoon program. Steve Porter has come to uh, the college uh, to uh, become a senior fellow and the executive director of the Martin Institute for Spiritual Formation or for Christian and Culture and head of the Dallas Willard Center for Spiritual Formation. It's a joy to see Jane here today. Uh, Jane, where are you there? And Bill and Becky with her. It's great to have you back on campus. Yeah. Years ago when this was being established, we had many dreams of what it would mean to have Dallas and Jane here. And all of that was, of course, changed uh, with Dallas's untimely illness and eventual death. But it's uh, been wonderful to continue his thought legacy, and always enjoy having you back on campus, so thank you. It's fun to see Gary and Regina, our founding director, and, and his wife. Thank you for coming. Let me pray, and then I will introduce Steve, and we'll look forward to his remarks. Gracious Lord and God, we give you thanks for this day, for the opportunity to think together, both of Dallas's life and legacy, and the way in which those ideas play out in our own life. Thank you for his attention, both to your uh, holy scriptures as well as to the great ideas that have shaped civilization across time. Thank you for those who've been able to gather today. Uh, we pray that you'll bless this time and that our lives can be a blessing to others. In Christ, I pray. Amen. Steve Porter is Senior Research Fellow and Executive Director of the Martin Institute for Christian Culture. He remains an affiliate professor of theology and spiritual formation at the Institute for Spiritual Formation and the Rosemead School of Psychology at Biola University. And I think some of these in the front row are hecklers that have come <laughs> to uh, greet Steve as he uh, officially begins his public responsibilities. Steve received his PhD in philosophy at the University of Southern California under Dallas and his Master of Philosophy and Philosophical Theology at the University of Oxford. He teaches and writes in spiritual formation, the doctrine of sanctification, the integration of psychology and theology, and philosophical theology. He has co-edited Psychology and Spiritual Formation in Dialogue, Neuroscience and the Soul, and Until Christ is Formed in You, Dallas Willard and Spiritual Formation. Steve has served as editor and managing editor of the Journal of Spiritual Formation and Soul Care for over 15 years. Steve, on a personal note, it has just been a joy to welcome you to our community. Uh, we're grateful both for your just personal disposition, the warmth of your personality, as well as your scholarly acumen, and the way in which you carry both uh, so beautifully. You've been a great blessing already to our community. We look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for coming. I know um, many of you, well, some of you probably walked, uh, many of you drove, some of you drove great uh, distances, and a few of you flew uh, here, and um, so thank you for, for coming out. Um, very grateful. Um, someone said to me not too long ago, uh, Steve, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to miss your inauguration, and, and I thought, did we mistitle this event? Um, I suddenly had images of uh, Provost Danu, you know, swearing me in or uh, uh, President Beebe having some sort of crown or something for me. But so I, I immediately, like any good academic does, I went to the Oxford English Dictionary and I looked up inaugural and I, found, I finally found the definition I was looking for. Uh, to mark a period of activity, a new season within an organization. And we're really here to inaugurate and renew uh, the vision, to mark the vision of what God has done, of what he is doing, and of what he's calling us to do here at the Martin Institute. And thankfully, I'm not alone in this work. Uh, President Beebe's already mentioned Dallas Willard, but Dallas literally paved the way for what the Martin Institute is about. And I'm grateful that, that Jane and, and Becky and Bill, and I'm searching the room for for there they are, uh, uh, are, are able to be here with us. Uh, again, President Beebe mentioned our founding director of the Martin Institute, uh, Gary Moon, and his wife, Regina, and they're here as well. Thank you 
Uh, if Dallas paved the way, Gary, you um, walked on that pathway and, and set up cones or something. I don't know. You did a lot you know, to, to make this um, all come about. And then the visionary leadership of, of F and, and Patty Martin, who are here somewhere. There they are, yes. And uh, President Beebe, uh, James Catford, many others who were involved in the founding years of the Martin Institute. And the daily work of the Martin Institute just wouldn't take place without Beth Cook, who is our administrative assistant, uh, and Mariah Velasquez, who's the assistant director of the Martin Institute and directs our on-campus spiritual formation work. Uh, Mike DeFuscia, who directs the Cultura Fellowship and, um, and is our director of cultural engagement. Uh, professor uh, Mark Nelson, who's a philosophy professor here, but oversees the Dallas Willard Research Center, and Gary Moon is still involved as well, overseeing various initiatives of the Martin Institute uh, under the banner of Conversatio uh, Divina. So thanks to all of these folks, um, I see my work is very much standing on their shoulders. Uh, more personally, my wife Alicia and I are partners in um, everything we do together, and so Alicia has been a huge ongoing support, and uh, our son Luke is with us as well. Our daughter Sienna was supposed to be here. Then last night at dinner, as I was talking about our arrangements to, to come to Westmont uh, today, uh, my daughter, our daughter Sienna said, who's going to Westmont? And I said, honey, honey, we're all going to Westmont tomorrow. And she said, oh, I can't. And uh, she's 15, and we thought she was wrong that she couldn't, but it turned out she was right. She really had a good, a legitimate reason, so we scrambled and prepared other arrangements. My prayer is, is that this time, uh, that the Lord would use this time really in each of our lives um, uh, to deepen our own uh, sense of his work uh, in and through us and in the academy and in the church today. Um, there will be three respondents and President Beebe will introduce them uh, in, in due course. You have a handout there and there's some summative statements uh, that kind of describe each of these uh, parts of my talk. And if you're uh, concerned to kind of follow along, I think there's six parts in total. Is that right? Is that, do I have six there? Uh, so you can you know, check them off as we go. Uh, part one, a treasure in a field. In 2010, Forrest Fenn buried a treasure box containing gold and jewels worth $2 million, apparently, in the Rocky Mountains. Fenn then released a 24-line poem that contained cryptic clues to the whereabouts of the treasure. It's estimated that hundreds of thousands of persons engaged the treasure hunt at some level, with many expending considerable time and effort, and risk uh, that led to injury and, in a few cases, death as they searched for this treasure. Several summers ago, my own family uh, camped in uh, Glacier National Park and Yellowstone National Park, and we too puzzled over Fenn's poem, keeping an eye out for the treasure box. There might have been one family member uh, who took a longish way back from a hike in order to look at a bend in a river that bore some resemblance to a line in Fenn's poem. The Fenn treasure hunt ended in 2020 when the treasure was found near Yellowstone. To describe something as buried treasure awakens our desire to do what needs to be done to find that treasure. Picking up on this, Jesus likened the life-altering kingly reign of God to a treasure hidden in a field, such that once found, a person would joyfully sell all they had to buy the field and lay hold of the treasure. It's interesting, isn't it, to think of the transformational reign of God as a treasure hidden within reach? According to Jesus, every one of us stands at the edge of a field in which lies the priceless treasure of the reign of God that conforms us to the likeness of Jesus, that we might become a light to the world. In our case, there are no cryptic clues to solve. Jesus says, simply sell all you have, buy the field, take hold of the treasure. I have to admit that if there really were millions of dollars in treasure buried in a field, I would eagerly even joyfully sell all I possess to buy the land. 
But when it comes to seeking first the reign of God as that treasure, I find myself hedging my bets. If you are like me, you might think to yourself, isn't the sell all you possess part meant to be taken figuratively? And perhaps therein lies an indication of what holds me back, at least, from seeking above all else the kingdom of God, that I require some clarification as to exactly what I need to surrender exposes that I'm really not as hungry and thirsty for righteousness as I might appear or would like to think. Much like the rich young ruler, I come to Jesus asking, what must I do to inherit an eternal kind of life? And Jesus says, sell all you possess. Give up your grip on the things you hold most dear, Steve, and come follow me. Why is Jesus always so extreme? As if we can only serve one master? Part two, I wonder how Jesus would have responded to the rich young ruler if instead of walking away due to his wealth, the rich young man had said, Lord, sadly, I'm not ready to sell all I have and give it away, but will you teach me how to let go of my attachments to these things as I follow you? While we surely must count the cost of discipleship, if Peter, Matthew, Paul, and all of us or any indication, it looks like Jesus is in the business of taking on persons as his disciples who aren't yet ready to surrender all. Peter is perhaps the example par excellence. Uh, Peter's famous confession of, thou art the Messiah, the son of the living God, is immediately followed by his faithless rebuke of, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. This double confession of both faith and lack of faith illustrates that disciples can realize in part, but not yet in full, what it involves to follow Jesus as Lord of all. We too say, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Jesus is, uh, just after Peter's uh, double confession, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, Let him or her deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. We see that finding the treasure of the reign of God is to enter into an overall way of life with Jesus, learning from him to despair of life on our terms in order to seek first the loving rule of the Father. And yet, as the disciples traveled this pathway of life, the way of the cross, Jesus repeatedly diagnosed their problem with this, O ye of little faith. Like his first century followers, we too are of little faith. We lack great faith or strong confidence in Jesus and his overall way of life. As Paul puts it, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the spirit, they're opposed to each other to keep us from doing what we want. This is at the heart of the Christian predicament when it comes to formation in Christ. A priceless treasure is available, and yet, as Jesus says, the way is difficult that leads to life. There are few who find it. It's not few are those who get saved, but rather few are those who work out their salvation with fear and trembling. As G.K. Chesterton writes, The Christian ideal has not so much been tried and found wanting as it has been found difficult and left untried. The intrinsic difficulty of the Jesus way confronts us with crucially important questions. For instance, how do we who remain of little faith learn to prioritize the reign of God above all else as Jesus did? Or to return to Paul's language, how do we walk in the spirit, not gratifying the desires of the flesh, even as those fleshly autonomous desires are in opposition to the spirit's desires with whom we walk? Addressing questions like these is to enter the field of Christian spiritual formation. I was at a talk recently where someone was advancing the slides like I am, 
but they were always one slide behind. And so, and I thought, oh, that, that's really unfortunate, but and I, someone should tell this person, but no one did, and I didn't, and they were always one slide behind. So now I find myself needing to check. Am I, is it, is it, is it, is it working for me? Part three. Uh, it's clear that Jesus and his earliest friends aim to answer these sorts of questions. Jesus call, calls persons to come unto him, take his yoke, his way upon them, and learn from him, learn from him in order to find rest for their beings. After three years of such learning from him, Jesus commissioned his disciples to go into all the world and invite others to become students of Jesus and then teach them to do all that Christ commanded. What Dallas called the great omission from the great commission is not the omission of telling others what Jesus commanded, but rather the omission of teaching them to observe all that he commanded. Students of Jesus and students of his way are meant to teach other students of Jesus how to become the kinds of persons who are able to, for instance, walk the extra mile, not be anxious, love God with their entire being, love their neighbors as themselves. For instance, Matthew 6 provides the curriculum for resolving anxiety. Do not be anxious about your life, Jesus says. What you'll eat, what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll wear. Your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. It'd be wonderful if simply reading that passage of Scripture would immediately eradicate all our anxieties. But God, in his wisdom, has chosen not to work in that way. Rather, Jesus teaches that the cure for anxiety is to gradually entrust ourselves to seek first above all else the competent care of God's loving reign in our lives and over the entire world. A kind of trust that does not come easily to those who are of little faith. While seeking first the kingdom and his rightness would eradicate the psychological basis of anxiety in human life, the interpersonal dynamics of this process need to be taught and understood in order for Christians to make much progress in observing Christ's command to not be anxious. As a case in point, Paul himself says that he learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Contentment in all circumstances was not downloaded for Paul at the moment of conversion, nor was he just reading the Psalms one day and voila, contentment arose in his inner being. Instead, Paul says he had to learn the secret of finding contentment. And that secret, he says, was that there was a profound sufficiency, a Christ sufficiency, available in the strengthening presence of Jesus. We see in 2 Corinthians 12 that there was a time prior when Paul was discontent with what he calls his thorn in the flesh. Part of what Paul learned in that instance was that the empowering presence of Jesus matured in him as he embraced his weakness. Given what Paul learned, it isn't surprising that he prays for the Colossians, that they would be filled with knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing, bearing fruit. Many commentators note that Paul's prayer is not that the Colossians will instantaneously be made to walk in a worthy manner, bearing fruit in everything they do, but rather that they would be filled with knowledge, wisdom, understanding, so that in order to do so. A few verses later in Colossians, Paul writes, we proclaim Christ by instructing and teaching all people with all wisdom, again, piling up these, these, these learning words, so that we may present every person mature in Christ. The Jesus way is a learning way. Part of the instruction and teaching is that Christian formation is a pathway of inward transformation. Jesus teaches that the healthy tree bears healthy fruit. And Paul calls for, for what he, he refers to as an obedience from the heart. Dallas again writes, 
In many historical periods, as well as today, Christians generally find their way into this divine life slowly and with great difficulty, if at all. The perceived distance and difficulty of entering fully into the divine world and its life is due entirely to our failure to understand that the way in is the way of pervasive inner transformation and to our failure to take the small steps that quietly and certainly lead to it. But what are the small steps that quietly and certainly lead to being inwardly transformed? As part of the answer to that question, it is important to understand that because the human inner life is meant to be congruent with the outer life, there are many ways to do the right sort of thing in the wrong sort of way. For instance, Jesus instructs, and when you pray, you must not pray like the hypocrites do. They have received their reward in full. He goes on, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. The hypocritical and Gentile practices of prayer, and then he goes on to talk about fasting and almsgiving, do not bring conformity to Christ because the intentions behind those practices, as good as they look on the outside, are not aligned with the loving reality of who God is and how he actually works in human lives. Such persons and their practices only get what they can get. The hypocrites might get social approval. The Gentiles might feel as if they are controlling their fate by their many words, but neither are accurately aligning themselves with the loving reign of God. What might be the contemporary forms of prayer, fasting, and service that are in actual fact misaligned with life in God's kingdom? Might Jesus say to us, when you pray, don't pray like the legalist prays, the self-righteous, the dutiful box ticker, the manipulator, the autonomous one, the superstitious one, the one who's trying to earn God's approval, the one who is just going through the motions. All of these and more have received their reward in full, and I dare say there is likely some of these that remain entrenched in every human heart. The point here is that life with Jesus in his Father's kingdom by the Holy Spirit, this treasure hidden in a field, is a concrete reality. It is this and not that. It's definable, intelligible, it's a pathway through life that Jesus lived and taught his disciples how to live. There's a definite shape to the Jesus way, truth, and life, given the nature of God and his kingdom, the nature of fallen human persons, and the subsequent nature of the divine human relationship within a flawed and demonized world. This means that it's an area of knowledge, and that knowledge is meant to be accurately understood and effectively applied in various life contexts. The Jesus way is not primarily something we do with the Bible or within official services of local churches, nor is it primarily a matter of willpower, nor shrouded in mystery, nor predominantly about waiting for extraordinary interventions of the Holy Spirit. Instead, among other things, it's an embodied, interpersonal, inwardly transformational way of life with God nurtured within the family of God, and involves efforts directed to the energizing presence of Christ. And yet, not everyone in the Christian church today, or perhaps even here today, or historically would agree with all I have just said about the Jesus way. Indeed, there are theological systems and ecclesial contexts that would say the Christian life is primarily something we do with the Bible and within official church services, that it is primarily a matter of willpower, it is indeed shrouded in mystery. It is predominantly about instantaneous deliverance. So either the view I have sketched thus far is more or less accurate, or it's off in some or many places. But therein lies the point. Determining the shape of Christian formation makes a difference to how we proceed and whether we too have our reward in full. In seeking first the kingdom, if seeking first the kingdom is primarily about engaging the Bible or attending services of a particular church, then there are definite things to do. And if not, there are other things to do. Uh, 
Part four, the recently forgotten knowledge of Christian spiritual formation. So there is knowledge to be had regarding the process of spiritual formation in Christ and as part of that process, knowledge of God himself. Such knowledge is meant to be propositional, experiential, and personally appropriated. Moreover, this knowledge can deepen over time and become embodied, internalized knowledge, akin to when one knows the particular dynamics of growing in a mutually loving relationship with one's spouse or a close friend. Similarly, over time, persons can develop a depth and profundity about the dynamics of growing in a mutually loving relationship with Jesus, such that they possess wisdom about such things. These are soul doctors of the church. The foundational source of this multifaceted knowledge is the spirit-illumined pages of scripture and the careful interpretation of those pages down through Christian history. In addition, scripture authoritatively points outside itself to extra-biblical sources of knowledge regarding human spiritual and moral development. These extra-biblical sources of insight are found, among other places, through careful reflection on Christian experience and the experience of human maturation more generally. Due to the accessibility of these biblical and extra-biblical sources, what Dallas and many others understood and taught regarding Christian formation is not new and can be learned through sustained, spirit-led attention to these reliable sources. Addressing three of his books on spirituality, Dallas writes, in these three books, there is very little that is new, though much that is forgotten. Indeed, if I thought it were new, I would certainly not advocate it or publish it. To see that it's old and only very recently forgotten, one need only compare it to the writings of P.T. Forsyth, Lewis, Laubach, Jones, McDonald, many others of the quite recent past. Then if one wishes, go on to the greater post-biblical sources, Athanasius, Augustine, Anselm, Thomas Luther, Calvin, and finally to the teachings of the Bible itself. And yet, there remain many who have read their Lewis, Augustine, and the Bible itself over decades, and still struggle to keep clearly before their minds the ways and means of Christian formation. I'm one of those people. Although understanding Jesus and his way has a depth and complexity to it in and of itself, the central truths can also become obscured by historical, cultural, theological, ecclesial, and psychological conditions prevalent in one's time and place. And so for a variety of causes, and in various times and places, Christians often fail to lay hold of this knowledge. And without it, there arises confusion, ignorance, distortion, and ultimately despair regarding the possibility of Christian maturity. Unfortunately, distorted and incomplete views can get reified in theological traditions, the structures of church life, the prevailing methods of Christian education, and even the settled categories of the human mind. The Jesus way not only requires learning, but more often than not, unlearning. We see this need to unlearn and learn anew right at the start of Jesus' announcement of his good news. Jesus repeated, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, that was a jarring corrective to the well-established first century, first century understanding of how to keep Israel's law. Even among those who accepted Jesus' message, the personal and cultural misunderstandings were frequent. We have already noted Peter, and we can include the sluggish fits and starts of the other disciples. In addition, many of the New Testament writers are correcting mistaken views of growth amongst the early Christian communities. For example, O oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, can be repeated of the spirituality of the foolish Colossians, the foolish Corinthians, and at least five of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. This pattern of misunderstanding and confusion ebbs and flows throughout church history right up to the present. Richard Foster says, nothing is more crucial to our lives or more central to the heart of God than the transformation of the human personality. We must see it as our highest, most holy task, this being formed and conformed and transformed 
into the likeness of Jesus. Unfortunately, Foster says, there's an abysmal ignorance today about the most elemental spiritual ingredients involved in character formation. When I read that, I thought, well, I actually don't think it's that bad, but maybe it is. Abysmal ignorance. Foster's not alone in this dismal assessment. Some years ago, the church historian Richard Lovelace contended for what he termed the sanctification gap in Protestant Christianity. Sanctification gap is not so much the absence of sanctity among Christians as it is the historical neglect of the study and teaching of sanctification, a gap of knowledge. The historical tendency for Protestants in particular to emphasize justification over sanctification, initial conversion over ongoing discipleship, union with Christ over communion with Christ, cognitive assent over embodied experience, outward behavior over inward disposition, and the Holy Bible over the Holy Spirit has led to Christians understanding much about the ideals of spiritual and moral life while knowing far less about the process of growing up into those ideals. Uh, Dallas pointed to what he referred to as the disappearance of moral and spiritual knowledge within Western academic institutions and Christian churches. In regards to certain traditions of North American Christianity, he said this, spiritual growth is not like lightning that hits for no reason you can think of. Often the mixture of theological understanding and history that has come down to us has presented spiritual growth as if somehow it were not a thing that you could have understanding of, that you could know, that you could teach, that made sense. And so we have often slipped into a kind of practical mysticism, the idea that if I just keep doing certain things, then maybe something will happen. We have not had an understanding of a reliable process of growth. Seems there are some good reasons to think that contemporary North American Protestants, at least, are regularly uninformed, or at least partly uninformed, about the ways and means of Christian spiritual and moral formation. Part five, we're getting, we're getting there. Barriers to knowledge of Christian spiritual formation. In order to help remedy this situation, it's important to have an account of why knowledge of Christian spiritual formation has been forgotten in the recent past. I'll briefly mention four factors. First, for many Christians, the idea of a moral transformational presence of Jesus is categorized as a matter of faith, where matters held on faith are thought of as insulated from reasoning, evidence, and therefore knowledge. What is believed on faith is cordoned off from the domains of life that are tangible, intelligible, and comprehensible. As Mark Twain once said, faith is believing in something you just know ain't true. Such an approach to faith does not provide the sturdy confidence required to seek first the kingdom in the face of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Second, the exclusion of religion as a legitimate domain of knowledge within the Western Academy over the last century has led to the marginalization of religious reality in the human intellect. Today, it goes without saying that someone could be a leading expert in biology, psychology, philosophy, even religious studies, without that person thinking God has anything to do with their field of study. In many academic contexts, taking God's activity seriously in one subject area is seen as an impediment to being recognized as a leading figure. Now, not here at Westmont, by the way. But, um, we no longer think it bizarre that a student can go through a four-year course of study in one of our, quote, secular schools and not have a single professor or textbook mention God or supernatural realities as anything more than a sociological phenomenon. This exclusion of religious reality at the academic level is perpetuated often in many popular forms of media, leading to a cultural zeitgeist in which God seems extraneous to the pressing matters of our day. On a recent long drive in my car, I listened to National Public Radio for several hours. The various shows discussed crucially important issues such as war, 
crime, poverty, health care, natural disaster, and on and on. After listening to various well-educated and thoughtful persons on these issues, it dawned on me that over the course of several hours, no one had mentioned how God or any other religious source might be relevant to these situations. Rightly or wrongly, religious belief and practice is not often presented in the public square as a source of help and is more likely seen often accurately as a contributor to the problems. However religion, ought to be, however, religion ought to be situated in a pluralistic society, the exclusion of God and religion from intelligent public discourse can easily lead to a collective state of mind in which God is an afterthought at best when it comes to the practical questions of human existence. Third, the rise of secularity within the West is of a piece with what the philosopher Charles Taylor refers to as the imminent frame of modernity. The imminent frame is an underlying frame of reference, whereby the very idea that transcendent things can make a tangible difference in human affairs feels either unbelievable or like escapism. The attempt to seek first the invisible reign of God or find God in all things is to swim against an increasingly strong current of an age disenchanted with immaterial things. Observing the beginnings of this cultural shift in the early 1900s, the American theologian Henry Churchill King maintained that the constant underlying difficulty of Christian living is what he called the seeming unreality of spiritual life. Within the imminent frame, it can easily seem irresponsible to entrust one's moral development to an invisible spirit. Lastly, perhaps the most unyielding barrier to knowledge of Christian spiritual formation is that such knowledge interferes with having life on our terms. Well-grounded knowledge of the Jesus way is a threat to our lingering entrenched desires to be our own God. As Frederica Matthews Green quipped, everyone wants to transform, but nobody wants to change. To become a butterfly sounds so lovely until you realize that there are things about caterpillar life you rather like. It's far more comfortable to live life with a cloudy, imprecise view of God's upward call than it is to come face to face on a moment by moment basis with the truth that the hound of heaven has taken up residence in the core of your being and cries out in your heart, Abba, Father. Dallas would quote Jesus' words uh, from John 18, 32, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And then remark that the more likely human response is, you will know the truth and the truth will make you flee. Since we are deeply habituated to save our lives rather than lose them, we find it tempting to keep knowledge of conformity to Christ at arm's length, subject to multiple interpretations, tangential to what really matters, and somewhere in the back of our minds, or maybe it's just mine, cling to the idea that perhaps none of this Christian business is true after all. Part six. In light of these and other barriers, what might be done? I'll focus here on three considerations particularly relevant to the mission of the Martin Institute. First, in order for Christian spiritual formation to be established as publicly available knowledge, it must be grounded on a secure basis of evidence and presented as such. To present something as knowledge is to put forward the relevant claims as the way things actually are on an appropriate basis of evidence that can be evaluated by anyone interested in doing so. In the case of spiritual formation, the relevant evidence includes biblical, theological, historical, philosophical, psychological, and biological considerations that when taken together lay out a coherent, clear, and increasingly accurate understanding of progressive formation in Christ. Given the long-standing neglect of this area of study and the subsequent confusion and despair, we cannot come to adequately understand Christian formation by relying on the presumed authority of charismatic teachers, inspiring quotations, 
or testimonies of dramatic change. While charisma, quotations, and testimonies have their place, we must do better at helping Christians, particularly those in a position to teach and lead, develop profound understanding and penetrating insight regarding the need and nature of formation in Christ, such that they are prepared to effectively communicate Christian spiritual formation as knowledge. But due to the barriers mentioned earlier, it's not easy to find one's way into such understanding and insight. Even if one were to steer clear of these obscuring conditions, much of the relevant biblical teaching is subject to an array of divergent interpretations, and the other relevant sources of knowledge on these matters are scattered across church history, across several academic fields, and across a variety of theological and spiritual disciplines, not all of which agree on the nature of Christian formation. So second, to establish Christian spiritual formation as publicly available knowledge, the biblical and theological work on formation, sanctification, spiritual theology, Christian spirituality, Christian ethics, discipleship, a bunch of fields that deal with this, and the like, needs to, it needs to be gathered, organized, and integrated with the aim of determining the most biblically faithful, historically informed, psychologically realistic, and otherwise plausible understandings of Christian formation. Unfortunately, biblical scholars, historical theologians, spiritual theologians, Christian ethicists, and the like are not often working together to unify the findings of their diverse fields of investigation. Furthermore, each of these branches of theology are divided among themselves along distinct confessional lines, traditions of Christian spirituality, and preferred methodologies. In the face of such pervasive theological pluralism, coming to a confident position on the nature of spiritual growth can seem impossible. And yet confidence in the narrow way of Jesus is precisely what's needed. One promising proposal is to engage in what Tom Oden has called, quote, consensual theology, or what one of my respondents, Amos Young, refers to as a consensual hermeneutic. Using Amos's categories, this sort of approach looks for where the spirit of Christ, the word of God, and the community of interpreters are converging due to the real nature of the spirit's transforming work in this case. Those involved in such a methodological approach collaborate under the spirit's guidance to conceptualize the Christian tradition's most biblically faithful and theologically plausible understandings of spiritual formation in Christ. Where there's more than one compelling account of some dimension of Christian formation, such a methodology humbly pays attention to where the differences lie between competing views. What can be said for and against these divergent positions? What's at stake in holding one or another view? And what further insights are needed to arrive at greater consensus? Such a unified approach to the biblical and theological material regarding formation would do much to clarify Christian understanding. Third, one lesson we learn from this sort of consensual theological hermeneutic or method is that the subject of Christian spiritual formation was not meant to be understood on the basis of theological sources alone. The Bible itself points to sources of knowledge outside of itself that are germane to the nature of formation. For instance, in discussing spiritual life, Paul directs the Philippians to Join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you've seen in us. Here we have the inspired, inerrant scripture pointing beyond itself to non-inspired, potentially errant, but nonetheless valuable patterns of spiritual living observable in Paul and some unidentified others. When it comes to Christian formation, then we need the extra biblical research of historians who study these lives and these patterns, psychologists, philosophers, sociologists, neuroscientists, not to mention artists, literary theorists, political scientists, educational theorists, and so on to help refine, flesh out, practically apply, and carefully articulate our best models of Christian formation. Now, the multi and interdisciplinary work just sketched may sound like a massive undertaking, and in a sense it is. But to bring together insights and wisdom of scholars and practitioners from across a variety of fields is precisely the work of multidisciplinary research centers and institutes. 
Indeed, in the last decade, several research programs focused on character and virtue development have come into existence. For instance, the Oxford Character Project, the Jubilee Center for Character and Virtues at the University of Birmingham, Wake Forest's program for leadership and character, and Harvard's Human Flourishing Program are each dedicated to expanding research on moral character development. But none of these have, as part of their explicit mission, the engagement of Christian realities that bear on character formation. And yet if we are sitting on the edge of a field in which is hidden a buried treasure, knowledge of which is essential to understanding what it is to be and become a good person, then we need research organizations that are developing and presenting Jesus's answers to these fundamental human questions. If you have followed my trail of breadcrumbs through the forest, you might have anticipated my destination. The core purpose of the Martin Institute for Christianity and Culture is through academic gatherings, publications, and grant-funded research to foster multidisciplinary scholarship to help establish publicly accessible knowledge of Christian spiritual formation. In order to assist Christian leaders and their organizations to more deeply understand, effectively communicate, and sensibly implement reliable and psychologically realistic pathways of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of the world. This is my most recent Martin Institute graphic. There's been various iterations. Conclusion. In conclusion, my title this afternoon is the rather cumbersome one of Knowing Christ Today, the shape of Christian spiritual formation in the academy and church for the sake of the world. I want to conclude by bringing the tail end of that title, For the Sake of the World, Front and Center. And in order to do so, I appeal to Dion Warwick and the Black Eyed Peas. Now, if you know only one or the other of those uh, groups, you, you, I can probably determine what age you are. If you know both of them, I also know. Many years ago now, Dion Warwick famously sang, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing. There's just too little love. More recently, and with a better beat, the Black Eyed Peas intoned, people got me questioning, where is the love? I'm encouraged that our culture is coming to ask the right question of Christians. Christians, our culture asks, in a world that desperately needs more love, do you have any available? Or do you know someone who does? Are Christians today just another part of the problem or are we the solution? Do we, to quote another song, know the answer for the world today? It seems clear that Jesus intended his people to be the light of the world that would draw all persons to himself through the witness of an uncanny agape love. This kind of compelling witness has happened and thankfully continues to happen. Tremendous good is done in our world today through Jesus' followers who have gradually aligned their kingdoms with Christ's kingdom such that the fruit of his presence in their lives enables them to help meet the, meet the desperate needs of those around them. The way forward for the cause of Christ in our world today has always been and continues to be the building up of the body of Christ in agape love. Spiritual formation in the academy and the church is for the sake of the world. Until Christ returns, we are God's plan A, and it's for that reason that we need to understand, enter into, and articulate as best we can what it is to abide in the vine such that we glorify our Lord's Father, bearing much fruit, and so proving to be his disciples. Thank you very much. Steve, thank you for those wonderful remarks. Let me tell you the structure of the remaining time uh, for our uh, conference. 
Uh, we have three respondents, and I'll introduce them now. And then following their remarks, Steve is going to reply, and then we'll open it up for general Q&A. The first respondent is Amos Young, Dean of the School of Intercultural Studies, the School of Theology, and in 2020, named the Chief Academic Officer at Fuller Theological Seminary. He's authored more than 50 books and 225 scholarly articles, remains active both in the church and the academy. Young's scholarship has been foundational in Pentecostal theology, interacting with both traditional theological traditions and contemporary contextual theologies, dealing with such themes as the theologies of Christian Buddhist dialogue, of disability, of hospitality, and of the mission of God in the world. Some of Amos's recent books are Renewing the Church by the Spirit, Pentecostal Theology and Jonathan Edwards, Mission After Pentecost, The Witness of the Spirit from Genesis to Revelation. Following Amos will be Greg Ten Elshoff, and Greg is PhD in philosophy at the University of Southern California, uh, also with Dallas Willard, and a Westmont alum, so it's wonderful to have you back. Greg is professor of philosophy at Biola University, where his areas of interest include metaphysics, epistemology, modern philosophy, and Confucianism. His book, I Told Me So, Self-Deception in a Christian Life, won the Christianity Today 2009 Book Award for Christian Living. Greg is the founding director of Biola University's Center for Christian Thought. And finally, uh, our own Andrea Gurney, Andrea earned her Master's in Education in Psychological Sciences at University of Pennsylvania, her Doctorate in Counseling Psychology at Northeastern University. She spent three years training at Harvard Medical School in Individual, Child, Adolescent, and Couples and Family Therapy before coming to Santa Barbara. She has been Professor of Psychology at Westmont since 2005 and devotes the rest of her time to her clinical practice in the community. Her research and writing interests focus on rebuilding and rethinking the ways we love one another in our fast-paced, technologically advanced world. Her recent book, Reimagining Your Love Story, Biblical and Psychological Practices for Healthy Relationships. With that, I'd like to uh, invite Amos to begin our replies. Thank you. Thank you, President Beebe, for the introduction, and certainly also for the welcome. It's always, I'm always honored to be back on the Westmont campus. It's been a few years. Love driving up from Southern California and coming into the coast and then up the drive here to Westmont. This time my wife got to join me for the first time uh, to experience the drive and to also come onto the campus. What do you want to do with that? Let's get rid of it. <clears throat> Steve Porter, awesome. I think it's about over, a little over 10 years ago when we first got a chance to meet. I got a chance to hang out with you at Biola for a few weeks, about a, a, sem a semester or so, and got to know you a little bit over in that course of time and been able to follow a little bit the things you've been doing over the last decade. And lo and behold, here you are at Westmont, and what, are, what, a, what a wonderful uh, place in terms of the Martin Institute. So consistent with just you know, the few windows I have into your life, the arc of your work, the trajectory of what you have done, what you have been continuing to work on, and now you get to put all that together uh, in this task that you've called Christian formation and nurturing that and making more publicly available our understanding so very consistent from my understanding of your own journey as a scholar, as a philosopher, as a theologian, as a psychologist. So we hear about the inter, the multidisciplinarity, and, and it's very much in tune with what God has been doing in your life. And so I'm, I rejoice to be able to be here. I'm honored to be able to add a few comments to what you have prepared. And everything I'm going to say in the next 12 minutes, or 11, is a long amen, so to speak, right? And in the Pentecostal tradition, the amen includes a lot of speaking in tongues, and from that perspective, a lot of interpretation of tongues, so I've got to give that in this particular context, right? 
um, about the things that you've laid out. I love the, the academy, the church, and the world that you sort of put together. The logo of, of your, your diagram about what the Martin Institute is doing in terms of how all that fits together. I loved reading through your essay and hearing you read through it. The scriptural ri richness that's imbuing all of what you've written and then what you've shared with us. So, so important, particularly when you're citing questionable characters like Amos Young in your paper. <clears throat> so for my next few moments, uh, again, now I've got now more like 10 or nine minutes left. I've got three points with three subpoints each. Now, don't worry, we'll get through that real quickly here. And again, it's sort of thinking with you about what you've done. And perhaps um, you've also invited me to uh, recognize really what a humongous task that, that you and the Martin Institute and what you're inviting us all to consider and then to launch out from. So I start with your title, Knowing Christ Today, and being drawn into the fact that our knowledge of Christ goes hand in hand with, if you will, our loving Christ. Our knowledge of Christ goes uh, hand and foot with our following Christ. Our knowledge of Christ, in other words, that's this cognitive aspect of the knowing, the intelligibility that you're inviting us to, to pursue after, the, intellig the understanding that you wish for, for us to uh, attempt to lay hold of. That's both the massive opportunity and the massive challenge, right? Because this cognitive part of who we are, as we know, as you know, Steve, given your work in the psychological sciences as well, this cognitive part of who we are is always striving to catch up with the, the non-cognitive or the affective or the embodied or the, the practiced. And so in that respect, that loving of Jesus that you are, I mean, that, that knowing of Jesus that you're calling uh, all of us on this journey on, in particular the work of the Martin Institute, is also about the, the knowing, the naming, the pursuing of the loving of Christ and the living with Christ. It's also the attempt to understand, to map, to chart, to get under the hood of the feeling Jesus as well as the doing of Jesus, right? Uh, if, if faith is always seeking understanding, then all of this work that the Martin Institute needs to do is the understanding that attempts to get under the hood of what's happening in our hearts, what's happening in our lives, what's happening uh, in our affectivity, what is happening in our habituatedness naming some of that, understanding, and of course that understanding then leads to a deeper level of, of pressing in, right, of being faithful. So knowing Christ today, uh, I, think, I think as I've heard you and as I've thought further about what you have laid out for us is the invitation to, to faithfulness, the invitation of faithfulness and, faith, and, and, and discipleship, which is that deeper level of Christian commitment sensibilities, affectivity, and habituatedness in following after Jesus. And in that respect, as, uh, I mean, the, the psychological dimension, I mean, there, there's this inner dimension. So the, so the Martin Institute could spend a long time and a lot of time getting inside ourselves or helping us to get inside of ourselves. Um, our son who finished his PhD not too long ago, also has just finished a course on internal family systems. And he's been practicing that on his dad. He said, Dad, I want you to just, you know, relax, and I want you to follow me for a little bit and find out more about yourself. He's inviting me onto that journey of sort of understanding myself in this, in this deeper level, in this deeper path. So the psychological dimension, I think, is... is Obviously, there's so much work that could be done there. But you're inviting us to more than just peer into ourselves, as important as it is and as, as essential as that will be to the work that you're doing. You're inviting us to also press through 
as you mentioned, the historical, the theological, the ecclesial. In other words, it's not just individual formation, but it's Christian formation, right? And so Christian formation, obviously, informed by the church, the body of Christ, and all of its permutations, and all of its uh, uh, diversification, in, in the length of its traditionings, its ecclesial traditionings. So lots of stuff to gather. How do different Christian traditions over time, over the centuries, in different uh, contexts, how have they understood formation, practiced discipleship? Right, practice um, faithfulness on the Jesus way, as you as you've talked about. So understanding that historical, theological, ecclesial set of sensibilities that that shape different individual journeys. Myself being a Pentecostal, my wife also growing up partly Roman Catholic for the first part of her growing up years, and then partly Pentecostal. Each one of us now together and as as a couple. Right, are, are in these communities that shape and give some vocabulary, some practices, some, some emotive prioritizations about how we follow after Jesus. I think the Martin Institute's project invites us to keep naming those, keep expanding our repertoire of the diversity of ecclesial and spiritual traditions that we might have at our disposal. And that might already inform much of what we do, except that we don't know where it came from. We just know we just do that. Well, why? I think that's all part of what that happens. But Christian formation doesn't happen only in churches. In the sense of that, right, people, we as Christians in the body of Christ, members of the body of Christ, don't live uh, 365 days a year only in our church. We live lives in all of their complicatedness, their complexity. We live lives in this, and as you mentioned, these cultural conditions and cultural contexts. So beneath the tri-dimensionality of what goes on in our knowing and our feeling and our doing is this multi-contextuality in which Christian formation unfolds. Um, the book of Acts talks, invites us to think about this in terms of the many tongues, of the many peoples, of the many languages of the world, or uh, the apocalypse invites us to think about the many peoples, nations, and tribes. These are the contexts, these are the broader contexts within which our ecclesialities also become intertwined with history, culture, language, and therefore invite us into a, a deeper layer of now this multidisciplinarity that's not only about unpacking the self, not only about laying out the diverse repertoire of ecclesial and spiritual traditions, but now understanding the living cultural context within which Christian formation actually hits the ground. If we all just lived in ecclesial communities, maybe Christian formation might be easier, maybe not. Probably your church is probably difficult. But, but again, we, we live as those who bear the name of Christ in the world. And oftentimes, that's where also the most deepest challenges to what does it mean to be faithful are pressed, right? In a cultural context, a political context that's so polarized as we currently have. In a global economic context within which there are multiple layers and layers of inequities that we have to navigate as Christians in the public space, in the market space, as Christians in the socio-cultural spaces of our times, whether it's here in Santa Barbara, across the great state of California, across these United States, and across the world. These are the broader, many contexts within which our Christian formation gets tested, pressed, and hence, how do we further understand what it means for us to love Jesus more, serve Jesus well and faithfully in our knowing and understanding Jesus in this context of racialization, economic disparity, political polarization, and all of the realities within which we find ourselves navigating. I guess the last part of it that 
Um, you know, I, I've tried to, you've invited me to think about, again, going deeper. You've invited me to then think about going outward in this much more complex space and, and the many disciplines needed for us to, to then name and, and attempt to resituate our understanding of following Christ in these multiply complicated spaces. And then I also wonder that, yeah, the barriers to the knowledge of Christian spiritual formation include certainly the four that you've laid out, but they also involve maybe this one other part that is uh, the reality for every one of us as those who seek to know Christ, love Christ, and live after Christ, which is that it's a journey. I'll wake up tomorrow, and there'll be a new set of opportunities and challenges for what it means for me to love Jesus, serve Jesus, and be drawn to Jesus. I'll wake up a decade from now, Lord willing, and things will be different. How a different day will be will challenge me to love Jesus and know Jesus and serve Jesus in ways appropriate to who I'll be 10 years from now or 20 years from now or 30 years from now. I'm uh, in, in maybe in the Reformed tradition, this might be a little bit risky, but in the tradition I'm in, I was saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. That's the path, the Christian journey. That's why Christian formation is probably a little complicated. How we needed to understand what it means to love Jesus and serve Jesus and walk after Jesus when we're teenagers differs from when we're in our 30s, then when we're in our 50s. And for me now, I'm finding out, what does it mean to be a grandpa who loves Jesus, serves Jesus, and knows Jesus when I'm surrounded by my grandchildren? And what will that mean for me 10 years from now in a very different cultural, ecclesial, and global context? You said at the end that this is an impossible task, and I agree, because it never ends. But that means you've got some job security, brother, so God bless you. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor. Um, uh, to be here and to have been invited to uh, comment on Steve's really compelling vision for the Martin Institute, so I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, I have to confess at the front end that I find myself enthusiastically in agreement with all of Steve's central claims, and, and that's saying something. Uh, people who know me know that I don't enthusiastically agree with much of anything, and so, uh, so that's, and people who know me and Steve know that we uh, bicker and fight about everything. <laughs> so, uh, but I couldn't find anything to fight about uh, here. So I've decided to focus my comments on just one of Steve's central claims. Um, and it's this. Uh, Steve says <clears throat> that knowledge of the challenging pathway of Christian spiritual formation is available. And coming to possess this knowledge is important in order to mature in Christ. <clears throat> Uh, Steve uses the metaphor of a treasure hidden in a field to call attention, I think, to the profound value that he associates with this way into Christian maturity. And he uses the language of a path or a door or, less metaphorically, a curriculum to describe the nature of the treasure that he talks about. So I'd like to begin my comments by reflecting on the nature of a curriculum. What is a curriculum, exactly? And what would it mean for there to be a discoverable and knowable curriculum for growth into Christ-likeness? Well, a curriculum, if it's anything, is a specific program or plan of activities aimed at progress toward an identified end. So, uh, for example, proficiency in Taekwondo has an associated curriculum, as does the ability to speak Spanish or acquaintance with the Western canon. And a curriculum is known to be a good curriculum when it has a demonstrated track record of helping people to make progress toward uh, the desired end. Now, Steve says that it's possible to discover and to know the curriculum for spiritual growth, the path to Christ-likeness. He says further that there are cultural, theological, 
and psychological conditions in the North American Christian context hindering this kind of curricular knowledge. And I have to say, all of that sounds right to me. But there are different ways of picturing uh, this availability of curricular knowledge. Uh, uh, if you agree with Steve, you might find yourself uh, picturing it this way. You might think there is this thing, this treasure in the field, the door, the curriculum for spiritual growth. You might think this treasure has been discovered and known by many in the history of the Christian faith, but that current conditions are obscuring our vision of it. And if that's your picture, then you'll think we need to address the features of culture uh, that are obscuring our sight of this treasure in order to rediscover or reintroduce or reestablish uh, uh, this previously known but lost to us path or curriculum. Maybe there's some truth in that picture. <clears throat> Maybe there are some previously discovered and known elements of good curriculum lost to North American Christians for a variety of reasons. And if so, let us by all means rediscover and reestablish them, or so say I. Um, but I'd like to present a slightly different picture of curricular knowledge, one that might further inform the attempt to facilitate knowledge of the path to Christian maturity. And to do that, let me begin with a puzzle. <clears throat> Here's the puzzle. If it's a central aim of scripture to present to its readers a curriculum for growth unto Christ's likeness, why do we find in its pages so little specificity on the matter? Why is it that there is, relatively speaking, when you look at the whole of scripture, so little attention given to the specification of curriculum for spiritual growth? The curricula in other areas of knowledge leave little mystery about how exactly to proceed. If it's acquaintance with the Western canon that you seek, read and discuss these particular authors. If it's mastery of Taekwondo, move your body in these particular ways over and over again. Uh, there's virtually no disagreement among the Taekwondo masters about the curriculum for mastery of Taekwondo. Very little disagreement about how to train. But as Steve notices in his remarks, among the masters of Christian maturity, folks who seem to have made their way significantly into a life of Christ likeness, we find profound disagreements over the curriculum. The action plan for growth in that direction. We could multiply examples, but here are a few. There's the curriculum that prioritizes imitation of Jesus' proximity to the margins. If you want to make progress, use what time and energy you have for the project to move toward the marginalized. And as you engage life at the margins, you'll find that your inner life is transformed. That's a kind of curriculum. <clears throat> or there's a curriculum that prioritizes contemplative practices like solitude, silence, and inner examination. If you want to make progress, use what time and energy you have for the project to engage these practices, and you'll find your inner life slowly transformed. That's a different curriculum. Then there's a curriculum that prioritizes participation in church. If you want to make progress, go to church. <laughs> Engage the sacraments with sincerity and religious regularity. And then there are hybrid criteria or hybrid curricula that take bits and pieces of, of each of these, and there are more curricula uh, besides. So what should we make of all this disagreement among spiritually mature Christians about the path to spiritual growth? That's the puzzle. Could it be that there is no single thing which is the curriculum for Christian maturity? Could it be that there is no single treasure buried in the field, no single path? Could it be that it is not among the aims of scripture to lay bare any specific curriculum for spiritual growth? That would certainly explain the curricular disagreements among Bible-believing Christians through the ages. But why would something so important as the curriculum for spiritual growth be left so wildly unspecified in God's inspired text? And could we still affirm Steve's claim that a curriculum for spiritual growth is discoverable and knowable <clears throat> if we abandon the idea that there is any one particular thing which is that curriculum? Well, to move in the direction of affirmative responses to all of these questions, uh, uh, let me offer one more metaphor, uh, a different picture of curricular knowledge. Consider the curriculum for a basketball team's success in the NBA. Uh, such a curriculum would identify a specific plan of action, a path 
aimed at a winning record. It would include things like a specific playbook for players to internalize by enacting repetitively, and a regiment of specific activities enjoined on players during practice time. That a curriculum is a good one would be a discoverable fact. We could discover and know, presumably, whether or not a particular playbook or regiment of activities at practice could be counted on to produce a winning record. But should, we for, should we, but should we infer from all of this that there's a single particular thing, which is the curriculum for success in the MBA? Uh, I hope you can see certainly not. Uh, suppose a new coach for the Lakers made it their business to rediscover and reestablish the playbook and practice regiment of the winningest NBA team in the 1940s. I don't think we'd expect much from the Lakers that year. A good coach knows that the curriculum for their team, the pathway to a winning record, <clears throat> must take into account the particular makeup of their team and the conditions of the NBA today. This is a different team. The game has changed. Opposing teams have changed. Outdated playbooks and practice regimens won't work. Successful NBA teams today must have their own playbooks and must conduct themselves differently at practice. Now there will be, of course, some general features of good curricula that remain constant. For example, emphases on conditioning and shooting and ball handling and the like. But those general guidelines do not a curriculum make. They don't tell you what you should do at practice, which plays you should internalize and run in the game. The curriculum, the plan of action aimed at a winning record, will be more specific about what to do with your time and energy in games and in practices. And it'll be a profoundly context sensitive affair. So the idea that there is curricular knowledge available does not imply that there's a single thing, a single treasure, which is this curriculum, this path, which is more or less obscured by the conditions at any particular point in human history and which must be repeatedly rediscovered and reestablished. In fact, it may be that a curriculum once known to be effective has expired, has gone defunct, or is ineffective in our context. And knowledge that a particular curriculum has gone defunct or is not effective in our context would be an important step in the direction of discovering and knowing the effective curriculum for our time. The idea that effective curriculum is context sensitive in this way would explain why God's divinely inspired text omits much by way of curricular specification. To be sure, scripture gives us important general truths about the contours of any successful curriculum aimed at spiritual growth. But these general truths do not a curriculum make. They don't define the path or tell us how exactly to organize our time and energies, how to train. And perhaps any further specification of the action plan in scripture would have inspired something like the new Laker coach insisting on a winning playbook in practice regiment from the 1940s. Perhaps Christians at each epoch in human history are left the task of developing the playbook and the practice regiment for spiritual growth in their particular moment. Perhaps the treasure is not so much waiting in a field to be discovered and rediscovered over and over again as it is waiting to be created and recreated by God's people over time as they submit themselves to the timelessly valuable and relevant but very general guidance of scripture. And that brings us to the Martin Institute. <clears throat> My prayer is that this institute will make known those curricula for spiritual growth most effective for our particular moment in the Christian drama. Though I hope the institute will learn from successful past curricula I hope it'll also be sensitive to the possibility that curricula expire, that spiritual growth in our particular setting may require its own playbook, a new treasure. I hope that the Institute will encourage the development of not one, but many competing curricula for spiritual growth in our day. I hope it'll be a place where people disagree passionately about the best playbook or better playbooks for our time and place. The creation of these treasures will certainly require insight into the current state of culture, the psychology of development, the general guidance of scripture, and more besides. It'll require, that is, the deep, multidisciplinary work that Steve envisions for the Martin Institute, and I can think of no one better suited to facilitate the work than Steve himself. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Steve, for inviting me to participate. It is such a privilege to be here with you all, and more so to be part of the Martin Institute. I've been thinking about formation for the sake of the world a good amount recently, and not solely because I knew I'd have to be up here. Rather, the idea of formation has weighed heavily on my mind and heart during what I've come to call my courtroom contemplations. For the past month, I've spent more of my working hours in Santa Barbara's Superior Court as juror number nine in a criminal case with multiple charges. Just yesterday, I turned in my juror badge and said goodbye to some of my new friends. <laughs> the court security guards, the deputy bailiffs, and my fellow jurors. Although my service had ended, my courtroom contemplations have not. And I want to share some of them with you. Now rest assured, it's not the details of the case that I want to speak about. Although it was complex and hard and intricately involved mental health, homelessness, violence, assault, and racism. Talk about hitting every major aspect <laughs> that we're dealing with in America today. And I seriously kept thinking, surely they won't choose a clinical psychologist to be a juror. <laughs> but at the end of the day, or in the middle of the night, when I was startled awake numerous times by replaying violent video scenes in my mind, my courtroom contemplations revolve around one main idea, formation. What were the factors that led this young man to commit the crimes he did, inflicting harm on himself and mostly on others? What has shaped his personhood and guided his decision making? What makes him a criminal and me, a juror, suddenly put in the position of power to decide his very fate and his future. At one point, and this was a couple weeks ago, in a lull between witnesses, I kid you not, that I thought of psychologist John Watson, who in 1925 said, give me a dozen healthy infants in my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take any one of them at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select doctor, lawyer, artist, even beggar man and thief, regardless of his talents, penchants, and abilities. I've always thought Watson was bold and audacious in making that claim, although it's not surprising coming from a hardcore behavioral psychologist. For Watson, we're formed strictly by our environment. Our surroundings shape us into who we are and what we will become. Watson adhered to Locke's tabula rasa, where blank slates and our experience writes upon us. So there's no room for our minds, let alone our will and our spirit. So the defendant who repeatedly steals, trespasses, and assaults others, well, it's environment, perhaps, that's responsible. Thankfully, we've come a long way in the past 100 years, and psychologists today recognize the complex interplay between our environment and our agency. To have human agency, after all, is to intentionally influence one's functioning and life circumstances. So, whether one adheres to behaviorism or takes a Freudian perspective or a social cognitive approach or a neurodevelopmental approach, all psychologists agree that to be human is to grow evolve, and change. In other words, wired in each one of us is the ability to develop into a mature, fully realized adult, just as an acorn develops into an oak or a caterpillar into a butterfly. We are all being formed every single day, spiritually, physically, intellectually, relationally, and emotionally. Those are the five domains of development. The pressing question that Steve is asking 
is how are we being formed? And perhaps more so, how do we apply a level of intentionality to our formation as followers of Christ? And Steve, you have so beautifully and articulately spoken to this. He spoke to the barriers, and despite those barriers, how can we be formed and transformed to become love-filled, effective, and powerful people of God for the sake of the world? For the sake of the world, where there are more suicides, more divorces, less marriages, more single-parent homes, and more depression and anxiety today than years past. For the sake of the world, where over 100 million individuals are on antidepressants each year, and one in four Americans over the age of 18 have a diagnosable mental health disorder. For the sake of the world, where social connections are weaker today than they ever were before, and are thought to be the primary reason for the increased suicide rate over the past decade. For the sake of the increasingly loud and hard world we live in, where God can seem extraneous, like an afterthought in our cultural zeitgeist today, how are we formed with God, for God, and in submission to God? As a clinical psychologist, I'm thinking of formation all the time. Arguably, it's the heart of my clinical work helping clients think through how have they been shaped by what I call their first love classroom, which is their family of origin. What currently is shaping them? And more so, how do they want to change? How do they want to be transformed? Having spent thousands of hours behind closed doors in my clinical office, and now having spent what seems like thousands of hours this past month in a courtroom, I can attest, beyond a reasonable doubt, that I agree with Dallas Willard's statement. The hunger of the human heart that is unfed by what is authentic will go for what is inauthentic. If human beings need something vital badly enough, they may even destroy themselves or hurt others, I would add, trying to get it. We are impulsive. We want what we want when we want it, and we live in a world that reinforces instant gratification and the primacy of our feelings. What Dallas calls the impulsive will, I liken to Freud's pleasure principle. I want to meet my desire, do what feels good and pleases me. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. I want to have autonomy and control. And I couldn't agree more with you, Steve, that our desire to have life on our own terms is the most stringent and ubiquitous barrier to Christian spiritual formation. Submission, let alone obedience, have become dirty words in our culture today. And yet, as followers of Christ, we are to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus. This demands intentionality, or as Dallas writes, a reflective will, where instead of just doing what you want, you choose for what is good. And especially as Christians, what is good under God in the kingdom of God? As I say to my clients often, we must slow down and bring a level of curiosity and examination to our thoughts, feelings, and actions, our mind, soul, and body. Because what we don't transform, we transmit. And this past week, I was powerfully reminded of that truth, that what I don't transform, I transmit. Anger washed over me on day two of deliberations when I realized we were gonna be a hung jury because of one person. My colleague Ron can attest to this, I rode my bike into work and I was fuming. I'm only able to teach an hour because I had to be in court at 9.30 every day so I could just teach one hour of my 8 a.m. class on Tuesday and Thursday. My patient husband could also attest to the fact that I felt flooded every single night 
And one of my coping skills actually is talking. I'm a verbal processor, yet we were forbidden to speak about the case until it was over. And we were reminded of that every day when we raised our right hand and took an oath. Thankfully, another tried and true coping skill for me is prayer. Talking with God, and more importantly, listening to him. And it was through tears on my knees early that, this past Tuesday morning that I remembered that anger at its best is love of justice. It's an ache for things to be made new. Sorry, I'm still processing the case. I, jo I joked and said, I need a therapist. <laughs> Anyone got one? <laughs> but anger at its best is a love of justice. It's an ache that things would be made new, a deep longing for shalom, union, and communion with God. And that is a holy desire. God gently and promptly reminded me to surrender. And I think Steve spoke to this because I'm somebody who admittedly likes control. Or at least I'd like to try to keep up the illusion that I'm in control of my life, and I imagine many of you can relate to that. As I was reminded that I needed to surrender, I was humbled by the freedom and rest that accompanied my surrendering. Jesus reigns, and Christ, our merciful, compassionate, just God, has the final say. I could open my clenched hands and surrender. There is a sacred mystery of learning how to surrender, and I believe that that is one of the keys to being formed with God, for God, and for the sake of the world. Thank you. Well, I'm going to keep my replies to those responses very quick because we do want a, a little time and we're running short on time for uh, audience interaction and any sort of questions and comments people have. But let me just first of all thank Amos and Greg and Andrea. It's, it's folks and, and scholars and persons like these that give me great confidence that if um, we got together in a room and began to think through some of these things as theologians and and philosophers and psychologists, um, we would come to some uh, important and uh, helpful uh, conclusions. Um, I'll just m very quickly mention, uh, so Amos, thank you. Uh, if anything, I got the sense you were complicating um, the vision even more, and, and, I, and, and I, in a welcome sort of way, uh, the psychological dimension of formation and naming that and naming the, uh, the, the process of, of that. And Andrea, some of your comments connect there too. Uh, naming the ecclesial and spiritual traditions that have shaped us and, and that are part of our own thinking about um, this knowledge of spiritual formation. Global contexts, you'll notice in my paper I often was referencing North American Christianity. And I was doing that on purpose because I didn't want to uh, make global claims about this. North American is um, large enough. But uh, there's all sorts of contextualization that uh, is important. And what do we have, what do we here in North America have to learn from our sisters and brothers about the spiritual life in other parts of the world, let alone throughout church history. And then Amos, you mentioned the lifelong journey aspect of this, and I couldn't help but think of Jim Houston, who uh, is kind of a grandfather in the spiritual formation movement, uh, and uh, who, who oftentimes stressed the stages of life and the importance of contextualizing God's work in life stages. And uh, that's where the, the, the Christian journey can also get very practical. And Greg, I think that maybe turns me to some of your comments of, I mean, I think you bring a very important question here of why is it that scripture isn't more uh, specific uh, about what the formation process looks like. And perhaps it is because, and I think I would agree that, that there is a contextualized, again, nature of it that 
um, wouldn't work very well if, if Scripture had laid out what the Jesus way looks like in a lot of precise details for first century folks in a certain part of the world. Uh, if we tried to imitate that or uh, move into that in a different time and place, it, it, might, um, uh, it might not work. Um, and uh, I want to I think more about your, your metaphor of, of um, that there's no single curriculum, just like there's no single um, uh, style of basketball or playbook. Um, uh, um, there's competing curricula. Um, and you wouldn't disagree with this, but, but I found myself thinking, yeah, but there's always going to be five players, and there's always going to be one basketball, and the court's always going to be one size, and, and there are certain rules. And I think a lot of the, the uh, recollecting of knowledge around Christian spiritual formation that um, I have in mind is oftentimes I think we, we and I'll, I'm not pointing fingers, I, you know, I, sometimes I'm trying to live the Christian life um, you know, if, if there's only supposed to be five players on the court, I'm trying to do it with one, for instance, or maybe ten, or you know, th that I'm not even living within what is essential to the Jesus way, let alone the particularities of it. And have we, in fact, actually reified in our uh, ecclesial and spiritual contexts ways of going about Jesus following that aren't even, um, you know, playing within the confines of what Jesus invited us into. So kind of what's essential and what's non-essential to the Christian life. But lots to think about there. And Andrea, thank you um, and sorry for your, thank you for serving uh, as a jurist. And but also, yeah, that sounds like it's been a rough road. And I appreciate um, many of the things uh, you said and particularly this emphasis on the reality of the brokenness of our world. Um, I sometimes tell my students when I'm teaching spiritual formation, which often times or has at times been critiqued, right, as kind of a uh, introspective, navel-gazing, very uh, uh, self-absorbed kind of thing. And I often say, you know, um, actually, I got into spiritual formation because I'm an activist. Uh, I, I kind of grew up in the era of Tony Campolo, if you know that name, and I bought Tony Campolo's spirituality hook, line, and sinker that the kind of, it's a bit of the marginalized spirituality, that the way you grow is burn yourself out for Jesus, and the, the most needy place you can go to, the better. Uh, and so I tried that for a few years and found out that I couldn't, uh, didn't have the inner resources to sustain it very long. Um, and so, but that activist call and spirit to the brokenness of the world and to the needs of the world um, has always been uh, kind of what's driven me, that, that actually the, the, the best way to be an activist in God's kingdom is to become more and more like Jesus, that he was the best evangelist, the best uh, social justice, um, uh, uh, I was going to say warrior, but that's not, that's not the right word. What am I looking for, Daniel? Social justice uh, uh, exemplar, uh, but he did it all from a place of love. And he did it all from a place of grace and truth. And so how do we develop more folks like that? Right. So um, should we just open it up for a quick time? Do you want, Gail, do you want to do that? Or am I doing that? Or we didn't talk about this. Are you going to answer the questions? No. <laughs> well, we are uh, running shorter on time. And so I wanted to take some questions, direct them to Steve, and then also encourage you, his email address is sporter at westmont.edu. It would actually be meaningful to start a public conversation because uh, I'm sure that there are many questions that we won't get to, but please uh, offer your questions now. I think there is a microphone that Mariah has if you wait for that. Hello, uh, my name is Grace Ng. Um, thank you, Dr. Porter, uh, for your lecture, and thank you, uh, all the respondents. Um, I'm a graduate from the Talbot Institute of Spiritual Formation, and I recently moved to Ventura County. So it's fun to see you here at Westmont, uh, Dr. Porter. Yeah, good to see you, um, Grace. <laughs> a question I had, um, especially as you had just mentioned, um, having that activist spirit, is that in a society that is full of inequity, how do we encourage theological reflection on Christian spiritual formation from voices from the margins who are not often invited to the table? Yeah, 
That's a great question, Grace. Um, well, I, I mean, I wish I had the recipe for that, but I think um, that you're asking the question and that the question is appreciated is the first step, right? So to realize um, what are the marginalized voices in whatever conversation we're in, whether those uh, have been marginalized voices of women, marginalized voices of uh, racial or ethnic minorities, and on and on uh, we go. Again, the global conversation, which Amos has done so much work on, I think that's, that's something where theological discourse in particular um, and perhaps uh, as well philosophical and psychological discourse, but I'm more aware of the theological discourse, um, really trying to bring voices from other parts of the world, uh, other, um, as you said, kind of marginalized voices into the conversation. Um, so I think the sensitivity to it and the invitation uh, and then the practical efforts um, uh, need to follow that, but it's, it's very important. Uh, as, as I mean, diversity language, as we all know, is, is an inclusion and equity, and I'm looking at another uh, student back here who works in that area, uh, is, is a, a very important conversation in our time, and yet it can be heard so much that we can, uh, at least I can, for, forget the, the value of it, right? That I'm not just trying to bring about diversity because, well, that's the thing we have to do now but that there's actually something that happens in our discussions when we're at times forced to think about things from a different perspective, a uh, perspective that has been marginalized or even silenced. So, um, so we need to keep uh, remembering that. I need to keep remembering that. So thanks for that question, Grace. Yeah. Thanks for starting with the hardest question too. So. <laughs> You might help us end on time, really. This, this isn't a bad thing. Sandy Richter, I teach here. <laughs> and Steve, I'm so glad that you're here at Westmont. Welcome. Thank you. I am not a tweeter, but if I was one, my tweet from today would be, why is Jesus so extreme? It's as though we're called to serve only one master. And I just want to say a hearty amen. Mm. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah. I do have a s small Twitter following, and maybe I'll try it <laughs> and see, see if uh, uh, Dan Speak will like it. Yeah, he'll, he always likes my tweets. Uh, sure. Yeah, you got to wait for the microphone, Jason. First, thanks, Steve. That was just wonderful and so fitting in so many ways. Um, the idea of being of being transformed into Christ likeness it has it has struck me increasingly in recent years and in listening to your talk today that there's a way of hearing that and conceptualizing it that no longer feels exactly right to me. So I'll say, going back 10, 20 years ago. Nothing thrilled me more than the idea of transformation into Christ-likeness. I think I would put it slightly differently now, in the maybe in the following way. What I want is to be closer to, more deeply connected to, and more dependent on God. And I think that as a function of that, <laughs> my character will be transformed. Mm -hmm. but, there, but, but, but what has struck me is that there's a way of thinking about and even getting, in, getting excited about transformation into Christ's likeness, where it's about me. I don't, I don't mean to make this sound over, overly prideful, but where, it is, where it's about me being transformed in a particular way. And that can be understood or, again, imagined in a way that's kind of solitary. And to my mind, that would miss out on what's really good and attractive about that transformation, namely that it flows from being dependent on and connected to God. So I wonder if you could just kind of speak to, to, to that distinction. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. 
Um, well, I mean, I think the point you're making is important, and, and I think the kind of um, excitement that we can have around transformation uh, can turn into kind of um, uh, an end in itself and a pursuit for some of, a pursuit of maybe some of the very things that we need to um, die to uh, in the way of Jesus. Um, and so there's a kind of appeal. Sometimes it's to power. Uh, sometimes it's to success. Uh, sometimes it's to, uh, uh, if I become that kind of person, then people will esteem me in, in a certain kind of way. Um, um, so I think there's lots of dangers about the, the presenting the goal as transformation. And I think you're right. The goal isn't transformation. Um, the goal is to, as to put it in Jesus' words, to abide in the vine as he abides in us and will bear much fruit. And, and, and I do think Jesus is oftentimes, and, and Paul and others are oftentimes um, emphasizing the formation, the transformation that occurs from that sort of relational dependence you're talking about. Because we do, well, uh, why exactly? But here's one reason to emphasize it. Because we do live in the world that Andrea was describing. And, and, and there is a deep problem with our character. And it's wreaking damage and havoc on this world in exponential ways. And so uh, to, to, to not insist uh, and make clear that the Jesus way is a relational way of love, but but it's also a relational way of becoming loving, um, it does justice to our need uh, to be um, an agent of love in the world and the needs of the world to have agents of love. So, so, I, so I think while it's, um, you know, while there's a danger in, and there can be a focus on transformation that, that makes it, that turns it into an end in itself, um, we just need to kind of help one another not do that uh, because uh, that's not the way. And yet, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, go into all the world and make students and, and teach them to do all that I've commanded. There, there, there's, that, is the, that is the call and, uh, and, and for good reason. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Steve and these respondents. Amos, Greg, Andrea, thank you so much for being a part of today's program. There'll be a reception on the uh, area just outside, uh, so please enjoy and prolong uh, the afternoon. Please stand and I'll close our time in prayer. Gracious Lord and God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to think together about our life with you. Thank you for Steve Porter and all of the ways that he has both been poured into and now pours out his life for others. Bless his leadership of the Martin Institute. Thank you for the life and legacy of Dallas Willard. Lord, may we go forth uh, renewed in our own spirit, and may we be living examples of you. In Christ, I pray. Amen. Enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>